I'm Jean Tabeka. I'm with Rally Software out of um, beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Um, how many of you have been to Boulder? Yeah, I, I didn't grow up there, so I get to say it's beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I work for Rally Software, but mainly what I do is not talk about uh, Rally Software. I talk about things that interest me with regard to Agile. And as um, you're going to see, I'm not talking about Agile today, so things that I think are useful to care about if we want to have truly successful organizations. Um, well, first of all, uh, this topic is important to me because I do think we need to stretch Agile, and I want to start out with a tale of two people. Um, since I'm giving the talk, I get to say that one of the people is me. Um, so there I am, hiking around in Boulder. Um, this is not me. This is the other person that we're going to talk about, and his name is Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, so we're just going to do a compare and contrast on um, Gene Tabaka and Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, first of all, um, Gosh, we both went to Johns Hopkins University, although he was a lecturer there, and I got my graduate degree in computer science there. Um, we also really didn't overlap by much. He was a lecturer around 1900 to 1905, and I was there a few years after that. <laughs> and we, were both, we both have a lot of interest in logic. I was studying it when I was in school, and it, it was something that really attracted me into the world of computer science, in fact. He, on the other hand, um, was the father of abductive uh, logic and is also considered the father of pragmatism. So while he was writing over 2,000 essays on logic, I was someone keenly interested in it. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, we're both authors. Um, I wrote a book on collaboration. He had his first book um, published after he had died. So he, ever, he never actually published a book while he was alive. The first book that was ever um, done by him was afterward. Dead or Alive, um, okay, I just described the fact that he died. Um, destitute in Pennsylvania, I'd like to point out also. I'm hoping that will not be my demise. I'm still currently alive. Um, his first book, as it turns out, here's this logician, and he mainly made his living from being a statistician. And logic and all that kind of work was something he did as mental exercise in the background while he was making a living as a statistician. And uh, he only, um, he was only lecturing at Hopkins for about five years toward the end of his life. Um, but it interests me that the first book that ever held any of his works around logic actually has the word love in it. And um, with some of the things with regard to design and complexity, I actually think that love is involved, believe it or not. Why should you care about this? Because given that I'm, gonna, I'm talking about design thinking and complexity theory and how they apply into agile organizations, doing a, my own little bit of research in there, I discovered that uh, when you read up on those disciplines, you'll find this same quote by um, authors in both those areas. Um, they both go back to purse with regard to why they care about design thinking and why complexity must play a role into what we do. The sole rule of reason is that to learn, one needs to desire to learn and desire it without resting satisfied with that which is inclined to think. In other words, the first rule is to wonder. And I love that that feeds back into some stuff that Rich talked about, which is design is imagining. Uh, because here we have a man back in 1900 saying um, that, in other words, the first rule is to, is to wonder. For me, um, that means that what we have to scale in how we wonder, um, we have to do with empathy and, and empathically look at the world around us as we design and as we pay attention to what we can or cannot know. Um, the first person I paid attention to with this is George Kemble out of the D School at Stanford. He came out of uh, IDEO and some of the other people that played with design thinking um, and said that I care enough about this <clears throat> and empathy around how we create design that I'm gonna dig into it and actually create a, a, an adjunct to Stanford where he invites people in from all sorts of disciplines to say, uh, what could we do that's uh, in wonderment with regard to design? Uh, I have a video, I hope it works, and it's George talking about some work he did with uh, a gentleman who um, 
created an incredibly designed uh, MRI machine. And let's find out what happened with the machine. Oh, that didn't work. Oops. Sorry about that. So I didn't set it up the way I wanted. Sorry about that. There we go. Let's hear George. Who knows what this is? This MRI machine. Okay, what's what's it like to be an MRI machine? Awful loud. Awful loud. What? Ha you have to hold completely still, right? What? It's impossible to hold still. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the MRI machine. It's really important in terms of understanding what's going on in the body. And uh, Doug looked at this thing, and it's beautiful, and it works amazingly well. He considered himself really successful. He was very proud of his work. I mean, it's the type of thing you put on a brochure and put a logo on, and you feel really good that this is your product. Um, so, but he came to the D school, and he, the way we learn design things is we have them do it, and I think we're redesigning the airport experience. And like, well. You can't just think about that. Let's go to the airport and do this empathy work and prototype and things like that. And after those three days of uh, including the design thinking process, he went away with this power of empathy, empathy um, changing the way you think about the problem and the importance of getting out and having that direct experience yourself. And he had always thought in the back of his mind that maybe he should go visit a hospital to see the product he used in action. And he did for maybe installations, but he never really had with that mindset. So he decided, I'm going to go to the hospital. So he went to a neighboring hospital. And uh, they open up the door to the radiology department, and there's his machine. And he's feeling really proud, like the, the music is going on in the back of his head. Um, but he just so happened to be there unexpectedly at the time so he, that a little girl was getting a scan. So he's standing there, and the way he describes it, he's looking at the, his machine this way, and there's a hallway this way, and he sees the parents walking hand in hand with their little girl down the hallway. And he could tell immediately that there was a lot of stress, like the parents, you, d you don't know what's wrong with her, the little girl. The parents were worried, like how are we gonna get our daughter through this? The, the, the daughter had no idea, she's just walking along. He was there when they turned the corner into the radiology room. The moment they turned the corner, the little girl fell apart. The moment she saw his machine, she was terrified and was screaming and crying and the parents were stressed, the doctors were stressed. It's a very tense room, it took a long time and this little girl, like 80% of all kids who get an MRI scan had to be sedated. In that moment, Doug had this personal direct empathy experience. He went from feeling really successful to a complete, fail complete failure. He never once, he thought he was designing a scanner. He never once really put his mind in the eyes of understanding what's the experience like for this little girl. He didn't have that empathy. And so he decided right away he needed to figure out how to see the world through the eyes of the kid. So he, um, he, he partnered with like a children's museum director and patient advocacy groups and it takes a long time to get funding in an organization that's big like GE, um, even as successful as that. And he just needed to get started. So he just did it himself and he got these group kids together like down on mats and he asked them what their lives were like and he was hearing stories like my older brother or sister went to camp or to the aquarium and um, he realized all of a sudden he, did, he wasn't designing a scanner, he needed to design an adventure for these kids and a better way for parents to get their kids through this process. And all of a sudden that opened up what he thought he should be doing. And so he now, if you look, this is called the Adventure Series. Um, and I think it was piloted in some like 12 different hospitals and it's rolling out and it's been quite successful. I'll tell you a little story. So now the kid at home gets a back, I think something like a backpack, at, it's mailed to them. The kid opens the backpack, um, the Adventure Series and his little cartoon and it tells about going to camp. And when you go to the hospital, you check in with the camp counselor, not the nurse. Even though it's a nurse, it just looks like a camp counselor. And then when you go, when you go into the room, they're like, let's go into your tent, because that's a tent, and you have to hold really still, because there are animals outside, I don't know. And, uh, and then instead of the kid saying, so why are you leaving to go behind that glass room, instead of the technician saying, well, it's dangerous in here, I'm gonna go hide behind that ra <laughs> ra radiation-proof glass, they can say, you're in your tent, I'm going to the camper. Right? And so the kid is now in this experience of I'm going to camp, and they know what going to camp is because they've experienced it with the kids. And with, with nothing more than the type of quick prototyping of the, the type of decals that go on the sides of buses, he was able to create this whole experience. And then sh he got the hospital just to fund it, to demonstrate that it worked. And then it's just started to roll and gain momentum within GE. Um, now GE Energy is asking him to teach 
them how he, his team has worked. Um, it's just, and, and just in terms of statistics, I believe the sedation rate has gone from something like 80% to almost zero. I can't give a specific number because I think that's called a medical claim, and you guys are still doing the research to do that. But with no, they're getting better scans with no change in technology, but now the kids are holding still. The patient satisfaction rate is up 99%. The throughput in the hospital is up like 7%. It's pulled a significant amount of new business into GE that they didn't expect before because these things would be in contract negotiations for like three years on the service agreement level, and now the hospitals are like, well, who has the adventure series? We'll just take that. Nice. <clears throat> well, he bring, when he's talking about design, he's, I think, going back to Charles Sanders' purse and saying, let us wonder what might be possible. And so here was a gentleman from GE who had a perfectly designed MRI machine, and yet they couldn't get children into the machine. Um, this is another book I've read recently about design. As you can see, it's uh, why design thinking is the next competitive advantage. And what Roger Martin talks about is, um, I'll show you a little bit later, about inviting mystery into how we do our work. And I think, to go back to the title of the talk, Agile has been insufficient for us because it hasn't brought in this wonderment and the whole reason that we need to be able to respond to change. And so responding to change now um, has to have, actually, a discipline of empathy and wonderment in it. The other person who I pay attention to is David Snowden. And um, he's quite the curmudgeon, if you've ever met him. I think he's very proud of that. Uh, so uh, there you go. And, um, but what's important about David is that he, too, cares about the humane view of life. And he says that in order to do that, we've got to pay attention to the complexity of life and the work that we do. So here again, both David and Roger Martin have quoted from Peirce, it is not possible to prove any new thought, concept, or idea in advance. And that's why I love the communion of these two approaches into how we get the competitive edge, the humane edge, as we're applying Agile in our work. Well, I think there are four barriers to inquiry, as Peirce would say. And again, I need to invite inquiry into what I'm doing with my Agile practices if I want to succeed. The first one is if you have an assertion of absolute certainty. I love this because I have been in the computer industry for over 30 years. And there had been a sense for a long time that you must be certain about everything a priori to design and that everything about the design must be certain before you go into coding, uh, and then you would lead to testing. But there's always a sense or assertion of certainty as you go through each step. And again, um, that's inappropriate and not useful to us. In fact, I think it's damaging. The second barrier to um, inquiry is maintaining that something is absolutely unknowable. So if it's absolutely unknowable, you wouldn't inquire about it. You wouldn't create experiments around it because we simply can't know it. The third one is maintaining that something is absolutely inexplicable because it is absolutely fundamental or basic. So we can't explain it because it just is. It's just the way it is. That would mean you wouldn't investigate into it a little more. And then finally, holding that perfect exactitude is possible. Those of us who have been playing in these environments for a long time, um, I think that if we look back at what we're trying to achieve in agile domains is to invite inquiry. But I don't think we've been explicit enough about it, that it's been more happenstance. That we haven't gone back and looked at, we're trying to dissolve barriers to inquiry. Fundamentally, that's what we're doing. And what I want to do then is say, through looking at design thinking and complexity theory, we can be disciplined explorers in how we challenge barriers to inquiry. Um, this is true especially as to quite preclude unusual and anomalous phenomena. So go back and think about um, what George was talking about with the MRI machine. If the gentleman from GE had said, I've created the perfect machine, technically, it does exactly, it's the best MRI machine out there, had he not seen the experience with, experience with the little girl, 
he wouldn't have been able to say, there's something more I should be investigating about my technology, about my design, about the ultimate product. He had to be prepared to let go of what he thought was his, um, his uh, little darling and check into what might else be true, the uh, anomalous phenomena. All right, an agile adoption story. So stepping back out of all of that, how does this all apply to Agile? I was in 2002 working in an organization of about 5,000 IT personnel, a small group, and uh, we were rolling out Agile over uh, 14 locations in North America, so we didn't have too many time zones to worry about. There were seven VPs that were reporting into the CIO who had decided we're going Agile. So one day, these 5,000 people weren't Agile, and the next day they were, because the CIO had announced we're agile. Now, he hadn't necessarily gotten the buy-in from the seven VPs. And you may almost say, um, based on my experience there, that some of them were saboteurs of the agile rollout. So it's a massive failing in agile if you just push it down on people. Um, the number of organizations that were defining what agile were, would look like for the 5,000 people were one, because we had one organization defining it, and there was one exact recipe for how you did Agile. So whether you were a COBOL programmer or an architect or um, doing stuff in Java, JavaScript, whatever, you did the exact same um, definition of Agile as everyone else, and we never retrospected on it at all. And so what happened? was essentially we had created an algorithm that we could execute and exploit. We didn't look around and explore. We didn't look into possibilities of what Agile might be and how we might benefit from it. Instead, we went right into exploiting. This is Agile. We're going to define it. We're going to get immediate results. It's all going to be wonderful. Um, that's what I call cookbook Agile. And if you're doing that in your organization, it may be painful. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't start with something, but going immediately to a set of recipes is um, probably not the wisest idea. Why a cookbook won't do is because um, we need to be retrospecting. Without retrospective, we, we have set up those barriers to inquiry. And without inquiry, we can't move through to learn the unknowables. We can't pay attention to um, the fact that uh, being absolutely assertive about certainty and exactitude um, doesn't serve us. Lack of exploration, lack of empathy, and lack of innovation are what result. So here's an organization that says they're agile, and they've um, plopped agile practices on top of the organization, but they have none of this brought into how they're taking advantage of agile. They're absolutely not getting any of this benefit from it. And so, ultimately, I think we ended up feeling like this with regard to the Agile rollout. We were just um, roadkill. All right. So I go back and I say, what would Charles Sanders Peirce say about this? And he would say, again, it's not possible to prove any new thought, concept, or idea in advance. And so we were supposed to be adopting Agile to invite learning and responding to change, and yet we clamp on this brittle process that doesn't allow us to do that. The truth is we live in a world that is complex and craving innovation. It's craving it more and more and more. And so I think we have to embrace vision with a sense of hunches and with an ability to actually invite exploration into how we do our work before we move into execution. For me, that means um, leveraging a sense of emergence of practices versus a cookbook, bringing empathy, such as the MRI machine and how we design and deliver, and then invite the wildly unexpected to go in wonderment into what we are doing. If we don't do those things, as Roger Martin said, we'll lose our competitive edge. These are not nice-to-haves. These are not should-haves. These are must-haves in uh, my perspective of the world. So three thoughts about Agile. Don't latch on to one set of Agile practices. 
right up front <clears throat> and assume that you're done. That's a failure mode. Invite this emergent of agile practices, not just emergence of better product. And then um, delight in the innovation of your empathy that your empathy brings to your customers. <clears throat> you are going to have the competitive advantage when you do those things. All right, what does that mean? You will thrive versus survive. And that's what I would like all of us in our work to be able to do, to thrive versus merely survive. Um, personally, in your own personal journey, that you thrive versus survive, within your group, that you thrive versus survive, organizationally, <clears throat> and I think ultimately, you feed that into your customer and the value that you deliver them. All right, let's get looking at complexity. I think complexity gets complex. Here we have 10 dots, and think about 10 moving parts in your organization or the way you build systems or what you do. Just all kinds of different possible things. But I just think of 10. <clears throat> if you look at those and you try to do all the connections across them, you come up with um, 64 possible connections. But the number of patterns that can be created out of that is 2 to the 10, which is around, I think, 23 trillion or something like that. That looks complex to me if I had to manage all that. Um, that means that we can't afford to just latch on to these recipes of order or algorithm or control. And instead, we have to pay attention to how design thinking and complexity theory help ha uh, blow things up. We actually want to blow things up versus put more control on them. <laughs> and if you're declaring that you're an agile organization and the way that you're doing that is creating more control by agile practices, you're in a failure mode. You actually want to go out and explode as many things as possible to discover what might be better. Where could we go to the wildly unexpected, the phenomena that are waiting to be discovered if only we give ourselves a time to explore? All right, the other thing is, what you predict doesn't come true. And um, I was in a talk yesterday where someone was asking about, uh, in a Kanban talk, yeah, but you have to know everything up front. I've got a two-year project. I have to know everything up front before I can start the project. And a number of people in the room are going, Ugh! because what you predict doesn't come true. What you decide to plan in detail at a very granular level simply cannot come true based on where we are. Um, what worked yesterday doesn't seem to be working today. If these things are true, what you predict doesn't come true, and what worked yesterday doesn't seem to be working today, and what you don't know is unknown, then you're in a complex domain. You're living in a world of complexity. And so again, you can't go into a set of recipes. You have to be prepared to explore. The thing is that um, having a bias toward analysis to manage complexity um, is not the way to go. Now again, 30 years ago, we had lots of analysis up front. I was working for the Department of Defense, and we had casts and casts of analysts and all kinds of rules about how to do analysis and how to document the analysis. Because the bias, the belief was that analysis will um, you can analyze away the complexity of a system. But the problem is you can't. Analysis is insufficient in a complex environment. Uh, induction and analysis alone cannot manage complexity. So I want to say something about that logic that uh, Charles Sanders Peirce was the father of, ab abductive logic. We must invite abductive logic, which is that there are multiple possible explanations. So a little bit about that. Um, deductive logic, deduction, is when we declare or define a rule. We, we discover and we define a rule. Um, induction, we're declaring a result, given information we have. With abduction, to go back to this, we're saying that we've discovered a case, and that's all we can declare. We see a case of what might be true, what might be one of the, the truths of what's going on. But that's as close as we can get. This is all going back to uh, Peirce and his work. We must invite mystery 
to allow innovative patterns to emerge. When we are applying abductive logic, we're creating a larger space of what might be true. And that means that when we do that, we allow emergence of knowledge and that emergence of knowledge then is evidenced itself in how we act, how we interact, and then what we design and produce as a result. Just my thoughts. Um, how do we make sense of complex environments? Here's the deal. So Gaussian curve, we all learned, I mean, I learned this, I don't know about anyone else, but I studied statistics for a while, and it shows up in a lot of other places. And there's a notion that um, each sigma away from the top of the bell curve dramatically falls off in the possibility of something happening. And so our attention is paid to, paid attention to around the probable things that are sitting up in the 34.1% section of the bell curve, or if you multiply that by two, 68.2%. Um, That's where we put our bias when we believe in the staticness of the world and the ability to explain it through analysis. What complexity theory looks at, and then if you read The Black Swan, have people here read The Black Swan? Okay, in The Black Swan, um, Taleb, I think that's his last name, he has three names, I can never which one is his last name. He talks about the fact that actually this is not true in the world. A gentleman named Mandelbrot, a philosopher, and mathematician um, who also introduced us to the world of fractals, he's kind of a cool guy, he said that um, these things are out here are modeled incorrectly in the Gaussian curve. Then in fact, it's a bit flatter than that. So these things actually are more plausible than the Gaussian curve allows us to um, see. We cannot see the low probability, high impact events, the outliers, if we stay in this world. There are, down here, but then again, if we flatten out the curve, there are items here that have low probability but high impact. And so if we don't design into that, and if we don't allow a, a large space and abduct into that, we're setting ourselves up for um, catastrophes. And so if you take this and look at um, what's really true, is the Gaussian world just pays attention to the probable. And if we move out of that into the Mandelbrot world, we pay more attention to these outliers of low probability yet high impact. So we call these plausible things. I think if we don't have a discipline of exploration, and if we don't remove bar these barriers of inquiry, we miss out on the impact of these things, and we don't know how to respond. We're assuming a world of induction and prediction versus abduction of discovering the different cases that could be true and paying attention to them. I had something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, well. Well, here we go. Um, these are some things that came out of David Snowden kind of looking at ordered versus unordered systems. And so again, I'll go back into when I started in um, computer science and doing a lot of programming and then designing, there was a sense of the world is ordered and therefore we can design everything and know everything a priori before going into coding and testing. That's the world. Um, there was not a sense of, and so we had to pay attention to what was most probable and design to that effect versus there are probably a lot of plausibilities out there and it's fairly unordered to understand them. I, I never lived in this world at all. Um, age, and I hope some maturity, but mainly age, has helped me pay attention to that this is typically not the world in which I work that I'm mainly over here looking at that order of complexity of just even 10 moving parts. So the world according to Dave is uh, his complexity perspective is called Kinevin. Um, the reason you can't pronounce it the way it looks is because it's a Welsh word. And so that's Kinevin. And Kinevin is about um, his perspective of 
where we are is mainly a variety of cases, and we can only know in retrospect how things are in coherence with one another. We can't predict in advance. A retrospectum tells us, a retrospective tells us, ah, that's how we got there. So this is what he thinks about that. Let's imagine, if you can, that you've got to organize a party for a bunch of 11-year-old boys, and you want to apply the three different types of system that apply in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random, you might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft, and it was socially constructed in the first place. Um, I have friends in California who've tried this. I don't recommend it. Um, the recovery cost is high, but it's a legitimate approach. On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the ordered systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. The learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds, and place those around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. Um, once you've done that, you know, the senior adult can start the party with a motivational videotape, after all, you don't want the children wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objectives of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Now, of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here, we draw a line in the sand known as a boundary in complexity theory, and we turn to the children and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. And one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes, and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it, if it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. All right. Only mildly opinionated there. Um, but it's interesting that he gives us an opportunity to look at the world in which we might even look at our organizations. When are we creating the rigid and brittle sense of an ordered world? Um, when are we in chaos? But more importantly, when are we in complexity? And so we want to have these probes or these experiments and discover what to amplify versus what to dampen. I want to step back again and say, in my agile uh, adoption story, we didn't do any of that. We didn't do it around our process, around our organization, around our culture. And let me tell you that it was directly reflected into the products that we created within that environment. They were brittle. They, um, we did not take advantage of what could be useful. They were non-emergent in their sense of value. So all, you know, organizationally, um, we reflected uh, what we were producing. So, Going back to the sense of, if you assume over here that this is the children's party, and it's very simple in order, you would do all the things that David says. What he's telling us to pay attention to is that in complexity, we can't know everything, and that if we did, there would be brittleness about what's true around us. We'd create all too um, natural, yet unnatural boundaries on things. And what we want to do is, try finding out how we could move around with more fluidity um, based on probes. Where are the attractors that say, um, what we're dealing with is complex, 
but maybe there are practices that could bring it over to actually being much easier to understand, much easier to um, deliver. The relationship between cause and effect reveals a system's complexity and appropriate actions. So if there's no relationship between cause and effect, you're in chaos. Um, and so let's look back over here. The, the model for Kinevin, and he says it's not quadrants, that's why they have to be roughly um, drawn boundaries. The, the model is that you'll know something about a simple system um, when the cause and effect um, are obvious and repeatable. Um, to do the work in a complicated environment, the practices can't be best practices as they are down here, obvious and repeatable. But applying a lot of analysis and expertise can give you the result you need in something that's just very complicated. Now over here in complex, wow, um, we can only know things uh, after the fact in retrospective coherence. That's why we have to continually try things out and run experiments and, and be very cognizant of the fact that rushing straight to best practices is not appropriate here. That instead we have to learn through retrospection what is coherent and that there's coherence uh, versus cause and effect relationship. And then finally down here, there's just nothing that um, is perceivable with regard to cause and effect. There's no relationship. And then when you have no idea which system you're working in and what uh, practices to use, you're actually in disorder. So to use some of his language, attractors help us understand with respect to experiments. And the kids' uh, party, he was, well, he was doing lots of different things with the kids. He was trying to figure out what would the kids like to do best. And so he's emerging with what would the party look like. Um, here, he's doing the same thing in any system that we're in, discovering in a social system, in our process, in our products that we're doing, um, finding out in retrospect what is the most coherent way of looking at things. All right, I want to keep going. So that's best practices over there for ordered. Over here, with enough analysis and expertise, we can rely on good practices. When you're in a complex environment, none of that is true. And that is the bias of very large cookbook agile approaches. Or sometimes we'll do some retrospection to get analysis in and then good practices. I, my contention is that over here, to be effective Agile organizations, to take benefit out of it, is that we have to rely on emergent practices. If you're doing Agile and you don't see continuous emergence of what is useful, if you don't amplify what's going well or have a recovery strategy when things aren't going well, then I think you're in a failure mode for how you're adopting Agile. All right, what is Dave asking of us? One of the things he talks about a great deal is resilience versus robustness. This is interesting when I've gone to hear him talk or listen to his podcasts or read some of his work. That um, we've had, again, in the world of software development, there's a sense of it's too costly for something to fail. And so we have to an analyze and design failure out of the system. It must be very robust. In this world of complexity, we flip that and say, assume failure. Assume it, and therefore, the systems we create, the architectures upon which we create our systems, have a sense of safe fail around them. And there's a sense of resilience then with regard to your practices and what you would design and what you would um, deploy. Not robustness because it's too brittle and assumes that you can um, analyze out any failure, but instead assume that there's failure and design in resilience. The other thing he talks about is that efficient systems aren't the best systems, that what we want is effectiveness. And that typically you'll see this in sub-optimization at the team level where you have a highly efficient team, but the overall system isn't effective in delivering value. Efficiency says we're not going to do much experimentation because that doesn't look efficient. We're not going to explore. It's not efficient. 
But if it's, the system isn't delivering the real value we want, that's an ineffective system. And so we want to have um, a tendency to go toward effectiveness versus efficiency. All right, going back into design thinking, we can look at the fact that these things um, are a very nice communion, a nice marriage with one another. Because what we think about in design thinking if the, um, with regard to businesses is that there has to be a flow of exploration, a balance of exploration with exploitation. So if you're always exploring, you're probably not going to make a lot of money off of that. Uh, you're probably not going to move very forward with how your organization is working. But if you go immediately into an algorithm of how you do your work, um, you're probably also going to fail. With regard to business, if you don't have a sense of mystery of where the value is with your customers and you don't create experiments around what your customers may want and go straight to a product that you believe is the right product, you're setting yourself up for failure. You haven't done enough work on playing with what might be true, a funnel of hunches of mystery that flow into a filter of more refined possible approaches or more refined products so we can do it on either spectrum. And then once you've done all that work, you move into here's the pr uh, process set that we'll stick with or here's the product that we'll go forward with. Because we've learned enough about the value of the process or the value of the product based on this. And then we keep coming back around and around and around. All right, in business we must balance searching and shipping is what that comes down to. If you're constantly focused on shipping, and you'll see this in agile organizations where they're focused on feature delivery versus exploration, then um, we're, we're not recognizing how complex we are in our world. We have to build in product owners, developers, testers. We have to build in searching and exploration with discipline, not just happenstance. And I think that's what design thinking and complexity theory, in their discipline, invite this sense of exploration. So going back to George, um, he then says, as you do that work, apply empathy into what you deliver. And that's a word we don't tend to use in Agile either, which is, where are we being empathic about our process, or where are we being um, uh, or, uh, exhibiting empathy with regard to our products? All right, here's what, they talk, here's what he's been talking about, and in the book, Change by Design, you'll discover this chart where true design innovation actually brings in human values of usability and desirability. And again, go back and think about the MRI example, where we could have had a feasible and viable product, which was what the gentleman from GE came up with, but the truth of a really innovative, um, design of product brought in a sense of human values. And that's kind of the, those are words that we don't tend to use in a technical world. And, and I challenge you to think about that, and I'm going to get even more into that here. Um, Who knows so, what this is? Ah, that this was the one. MRI okay. machine. <laughs> Sorry, there. And <laughs> one of the ways you can learn to do this is um, a great uh, simulation called the gift giving exercise. I've, spent, I've facilitated that a number of times, but you can just go out to the D School site and download the facilitation guide and then all of the materials for people to practice how to go through, and I'll show you that again later, how to go through this whole process of interview and learning and then lots of prototyping and then going and checking in with your user, how did I do? And then coming back through. These things aren't serial, they constantly flow into one another. A sense of inspiration, ideation, and implementation. I like this for so many reasons, and I love that this is on the heels of what Rich was talking about. If you think about music, and how the harmony and melody emerge in music. We, we're inspir we have inspiration and ideation and implementation. He didn't use those words, but those words were in my head as he was talking about design and as he was comparing design and music. I think these are the truths that would be um, 
uh, associated with that kind of design as well. For me, I'm applying it back into, oops, empathy and this flow um, and all of that work. But the truth is it is, um, I think, core to really good design. Um, George also talks about low fidelity prototypes or non-precious prototypes. So as you're doing this work, these things should be so crummy, so bad, that you'd be prepared to throw it away right away. And so you create things out of popsicle sticks or aluminum foil with lots of glue because you're prepared to throw it away. If you put too much effort into your prototype, it becomes hard for you to let go of it. And it becomes hard for the person you prototyped it for to tell you, no, I don't like it, because you put so much time into it. Um, here's some work that we did using the, um, the gift giving exercise. And you stand around afterward and share with one another what are the things you learned in your interviews, constant interviewing, constant checking back in as you empathize and ideate. All right, so what does this mean to us? Well, I don't think we can scale Agile, which I think we're all trying to do if we're adopting Agile, not just keeping it in one team. I don't think we can scale it without these disciplines of exploration, um, a sense of wonder, and um, a sense of the abductive logic we need in order to continue to get better and better to have the emergent practices that cookbook agile simply isn't going to do. We need to explore, empathize, and innovate. That has to be built into what we do in agile. And so um, wrapping it up here, combine exploration and exploitation. Otherwise, you're in a soup of either only shipping or a soup of never getting anything out. That means we look in, back into Roger Martin's work where we um, hold on to the sense of mystery and heuristics and algorithm. We don't go directly to a cookbook of our process, nor do we go directly to exactly what the product would be. We're constantly playing with everything and with discipline. Um, out of the work of um, David Snowden, he mentioned the probe. The probe idea is to set up experiments, discover what's true about the experiment from running it, and then respond to it, as he said, either by amplifying what's working or recovering or dampening based on what's not working. And this is a very disciplined work. Um, he has uh, action plans for running the experiments in a complex domain. It's completely templated out how you would do this. So this isn't just willy-nilly. There's a great deal of discipline around it. Um, we want to move around from this domain and see what might be able to become repeatable, but still recognize that probes must continue to occur. All right. Three practices I'd like you to take back out of this. Future backwards is uh, an approach out of complexity theory and Kinevin, and it has to do with the acknowledgement that we can only understand things through retrospective coherence. Here's just some background on that. In a future backwards, people declare their current state. They do that together as a team, and then they talk about um, turning points from what could be happening from the current state or how they got there. So they look at where they are and how they got there. And then I did this with a group down in Wellington, New Zealand, and they loved it. Um, you declare what heaven would look like and you declare what hell would look like. And then you sort of work backwards to what might be the things that would lead to heaven from your current state. And what might be the things that would lead you to hell from your current state? And again, these are just possible cases of what would get you there. And then um, you check into the accidents that might happen along the way. And that's that thing of not knowing what could be true. Um, you can do it very much more easily uh, with just declaring the current state, um, turn backwards from the current state to heaven and hell, and then discover what's really going on around that. 
Here we are doing it with some of my colleagues at Rally. We did a lot of um, forward, uh, future backwards in every department to discover where they were and where they might want to be versus where they didn't want to be. And it actually brought, a lot, uh, brought about a lot of organizational, organizational changes for us, as well as some other directions of where we wanted to go with products and services. The empathize and innovate work, you can go back into the gift giving experience. Um, so there's that um, URL again, where you can try this yourself on how you do empathy. And one of the things that's involved in this is a lot of empathy interviewing. So we have a group here um, in Raleigh. This is our collaboration area outside where I sit in the office of the CTO. And we've been running empathy interviews in preparation of a massive planning meeting. We want to find out how to change the process of steering and planning because we consider ourselves an agile organization. And so first, we go out and run a bunch of empathy interviews. You just ask people one-on-one -on -one a lot of questions to find out what works for them or what wouldn't work for them, what their desires are, their hopes and wishes for an outcome. And then a number of us read the interviews and start creating different sticky notes of what we hear the person saying, thinking, feeling, or doing. And so a bunch of us are just brainstorming that. And this is all available on the dschool site. Down here, you can see that, um, and my board's a little messed up because we were doing a lot with it. We look at the things each of us has been hearing uh, and thinking about noticing from the empathy interviews, and we start to notice trends. Wow, we really heard a lot about this. People seem to really be feeling that. And you take that into defining personas that go across these domains. This kind of user, so this is camaraderie Camilla, this is uh, structure Sally, this is involved Ivan, um, they want or need a discipline um, because of this um, problem here. And so we start creating these personas, and that leads to possible points of view. So again, just emerging into where we might be through empathy. So and so, distributed Dan needs a way to get results, but surprisingly, uh, the people um, involved in these initiatives um, are hard to get involved with because he's remote. And each one of them we're paying attention to, how can we respond to them as we do our work? And then you come up with a final problem statement of, this is the number one problem we need to recognize right now. So you declare what you're going to concentrate on. And this is all through empathy interviews and the work we do around the empathy interviews. To go back to the beginning, um, it's not possible to prove any new thought, concept, or idea in advance. This was stated by Charles Sanders Peirce in late 19th century, early 20th century. For me, that means we have to be willing to seek ah, the wildly unexpected, to use that wonderment that he asked us to think about over a century ago. That's a lot to ask of you. Um, could look like it's a mad world that we're living in. And since I had two other videos, I'm going to show you one last video. And then we can check in with questions that you have.
find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take. When people run in circles, it's a very, very bad world. world. Children waiting for the day they feel good. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Tell me what's my lesson Look right through me Look right through me And I find it kind of funny I find it kind of sad The dreams in which I'm dying Are the best I've ever had I find it hard to tell you I find it hard to take The people run in circles It's a very I think that when I talk about all that complexity, it can look like a mad world and all the things are just thrown at you and through a fire hose. I love this video because I see people emerging and doing amazing things um, despite the fact that we have so much going on around us. Um, that's all I had for now and we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm, would like to invite you to see what ideas and thoughts you have regarding the um, complexity theory and design thinking applied to agile organizations. Yeah. The question, um, we talked a lot about uh, emergent practices versus good practices and best practices and how the emergent practices kind of help you learn uh, what those attractors were and learn some of the good things. Um, so as you do that and you develop good practices from your emergent ones, is there like a, a, a kind of a practice to get rid of the good practices that they no longer apply so that your emergent practices don't become so overwhelming that they become the, the blockers? Um, if I understand your question, it's about we're um, accepting the usefulness of emergent practices that you can't jump immediately to good or best practices. And is there a practice for how to get rid of good practices once you've discovered emergent practices? Um, I think that's a pull system of paying attention to, again, if you think about David Snowden's words, where do we amplify the emergent practices and then where, where do we dampen or recover from the good practices that don't serve us anymore? There's another flow he also talks about for attractors, which is discover when we need less and less analysis, that we have actually can have something much more repeatable, and I think that does occur. Um, and though you can move those into best practices, my, my fear and, and gut horror is that we tend to jump too quickly into defining best practices, those cookbooks of an, ad, of an agile rollout without paying attention to, it's going to take people prepared to be explorers before we assume people can just be thrown into something and just hand them best practices and now we're going to be perfect at Agile. What I prefer is emergence and discovering what practices can become good practices and so those would be pulled through the organization and then we'd discover what the best practices were and those would create our standard and it would forever be organic and changing because there's always something emerging through that exploration. Yeah? In your experience, how do you get stakeholders to be open to 
How do you get stakeholders to be um, open to exploration um, uh, with great difficulty? And so typically you need to have an executive sponsor who says, I'm willing to take part of the business and put you over here and have you do this because I'm not willing to bet the whole business on it. But I've got to learn more about this approach. Um, Jeffrey Moore does some stuff in this area too um, called Escape Velocity, just to throw another book reference at you, where he says if you don't take part of your business and try to do some of this work, you're, you're still in 20th century thinking. And um, I've gone and talked to a lot of organizations about this. Very few executives are willing to take what they call a risk. And what I tell them is, you're actually at risk when you're not doing this. But you don't have to listen to me if you don't want to. I, I go in and say, you're at risk if you're not trying this, if you're not doing it. Yeah? So to the flip side of that, um, when you do have executive buy-in, um, but you're dealing with a team who's been um, in, in an old model not exploring for a very long time, how do you bring them out of that and, and get them to open up to the possibility of exploring new things? Okay, if you have executive buy-in, but people or a team aren't used to being more in this exploratory role, um, you go find another team. There are people who simply are not explorers. That's not what they're used to, or they have learned to let go of that. I think we can call them, from the lean startup language, um, intrapreneurs. And so you go find the intrapreneurs within your organization who are saying, I'm thirsty, craving, hungry, dying to do more exploration. In our software world, um, you can invite the people who are willing to do hackathons, that they're willing to put aside their regular work, lean into something difficult, bring their gifts in in a way that haven't been invited before and say, I'm going to make myself vulnerable and I'm going to go try something new. And we do this at our company. Every quarter we stop doing feature delivery and we run what's called a hackathon. But you pick what you're going to work on, declare that you'll demo it, and that makes you highly exposed. And you've got to find the people willing to do that. You, you don't push this on people. You invite it and pull it. And I think we're out of time. One more question? Um, you touched a little bit on how you have to start somewhere with some set of practices. Mm -hmm. How do you identify which practices are good to a place to start versus ones that may box you in? Well, which practices are the ones that are good to start with versus the ones that may bl block you in? Or Yeah, OK. You have to run experiments on that. And so for instance, at our company, um, some of the first stuff we did was the future backwards work so that we could discover what's going on organizationally. And it, we took a chance on whether it would work or not. We tried it up with one or two groups that were willing to, and then other groups said, actually, we want to do that too. If people didn't want to do it, then we stopped doing it. The empathy interview work we do, we did it with one group, and the other group said, hey, we want to do that too. Now, we would never go through any process change or any product change or any way we run organizationally without doing empathy interviews. It would be sort of like, hey, wait a minute, nobody interviewed us. So you, you can't push this on us. So that's emerged as something as a best practice for us, that we run empathy interviews. All right, thank you all so much. I greatly appreciate it.